Hello, Karis family. I uh, hope you're doing well. I don't think I've ever welcomed you to uh, <clears throat> our bedroom. This is, uh, well, what, what you can see is a portion of our, our guest bedroom in our home that I've kind of converted into a makeshift recording studio where uh, I record all the messages that we have been posting online. Uh, this is now the sixth message that I've given in this fashion, which means that we now not met together as a church for the better part of 40 days. Uh, as I mentioned in my message last week, although the vast majority of us are not suffering intensely at this time, I think that it goes without saying that the effects of the sheltering in place order that we've now been experiencing and enduring for uh, more than a month now is certainly having an impact upon us psychologically and emotionally, even if it might be happening slowly and therefore almost imperceptibly over time. I was listening to a message from John Mark Comer, uh, a young pastor up in uh, Portland, Oregon. Uh, I've mentioned him a number of times in the past. Uh, he's an individual from which I've borrowed a number of ideas from in some of my sermon series. And he mentioned recently that he became aware of an article that was based on a recent interview that was done with David Kessler. And the title of this article, which was directed to the general public, was That Discomfort You're Feeling is Grief. Now, uh, David Kessler is an individual who worked together with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross who is famous for her groundbreaking work on the topic of grief, whereby she identified the five stages of grief, uh, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, which really helped to form a framework for understanding the process of grief. Although David Kessler has recently come out and mentioned that he wouldn't take this framework or process to be understood as happening in a strictly linear sense, meaning that you don't just move on from one stage and never go back. Uh, Kessler says that it's not that simple, uh, that grief is a messy process. But what was helpful about this article is that it, it, it identified and it put language to what it is that all of us are experiencing during this time. Because if you can identify what it is that you're experiencing and what it is that you're feeling, then at least you have an understanding of how to go about dealing with it. In this article, David Kessler was asked the question, people are feeling any number of things right now. Is it right to call some of what they're feeling grief? And here's how he responded. He said, yes, and we're feeling a number of different griefs. We feel the world has changed, and it has. We know this is temporary, but it doesn't feel that way. And we realize things will be different. Just as going to the airport is forever different from how it was before 9-11, things will change, and this is the point at which they changed. The loss of normalcy, the fear of economic toll, the loss of connection, this is hitting us, and we're grieving collectively. We are not used to this kind of collective grief in the air. Now, for me personally, I don't think that I would have put the label of grief on what it is that I am experiencing. But then, grief typically does involve loss. And so from that perspective, I think it's certainly true that we are all dealing with loss to different and varying degrees. Uh, some have lost their jobs or their ability to work. Unfortunately and tragically for some in our country and around the world, they've lost loved ones to this virus. Uh, some of us have lost out on our senior balls and our high school graduation ceremonies. Others have lost out on the vacation that we had been planning and, and the places and the people that we had hoped to visit. Uh, many of you are missing out on sporting events that you would have been participating in or at least preparing for. I mean, I know for me personally, I continue to feel the loss of the sporting events that I normally look forward to watching during this time of the year. I miss out on going to restaurants, 
uh, and meeting some of you over lunch or over coffee or seeing you at church. So yeah, uh, we've all lost some of our freedoms and relationships and human connections. And so that discomfort that you're feeling is grief. Having said that, if you were to read the article of the interview with David Kessler, I find his prescription of how to deal with our grief, although helpful, I mean, don't get me wrong, I think his approach is definitely helpful in a lot of ways, but from a bigger picture, wider perspective and meaning, I feel like it falls short. In his book, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering by Timothy Keller, he talks about the five major worldviews and how the modern Western worldview is the least equipped of the five to deal with pain and suffering and grief. Uh, in a secular worldview, which is what our culture now is, I mean, we are no longer a predominantly Christian culture. Uh, some would argue that we never really were, but that's an argument for another time. But right now, we are a secular culture and probably have been for some time. And secularism in a broad sense means that our culture seeks to exclude religious considerations when dealing with matters of principle and governmental affairs. The assumption of this worldview is that there's no real underlying purpose to life. Everything is an accident, therefore suffering itself is an accident, and the default response of people that subscribe to this worldview is to avoid suffering at all costs and to minimize discomfort by bettering our social mechanisms. So life becomes more about survival and about the seeking after of pleasure. But of course, we all suffer. I mean, there's no getting around it. We know that Jesus emphasized this in his Sermon on the Mount when he declared that the winds and the rains and the storms of life are going to fall on everyone. And so the weakness to this worldview is obvious to me. And most people, therefore, try to avoid suffering and grief, or at best, they, they try to minimize it through coping mechanisms that, that really mask the pain but don't really deal with the underlying grief. In his seminal book, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl wrote about his experience in the Nazi concentration camps and how his observation was that the people that endured the atrocities of that time weren't necessarily the strongest ones or the most intelligent ones or the most resourceful ones, but they were the ones who somehow were able to find meaning and purpose even in their suffering. So that got me to thinking, well, what could be the purposes that we might find in difficult times like these? because suffering is nothing new to the human experience. If you look throughout the scriptures, you will see that suffering and grief is a very common experience for those who choose to follow God. In fact, from a scriptural point of view, grief can almost be seen as somewhat of a spiritual practice of sorts, which in the language of the Bible is referred to as a lament. There's an entire book in the Old Testament named after laments. Two-thirds of the Psalms are in the form of laments as well. Now, a, a lament is a form of a prayer. It's the cry of our heart in protest over evil or calamity or misfortune that one is experiencing, and in the course of processing through it, you express your honest feelings before God. So lamenting in the scriptural sense is praying our sufferings, praying out our grievances before God. When you hurt your body, like you know, fracture your arm or maybe tear a ligament in your knee, you cry out in pain. And that's normal. That's healthy. And likewise, when you are wounded emotionally or wounded in your soul, it's also appropriate and healthy to cry out from that pain, to cry out from that grief. If you look in the book of Lamentations or throughout the Psalms, you will see the expression of grief at all the different stages. You'll find denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. The, the full gamut of the emotional experience of grief is on display, and it's raw. 
It's raw emotion. It's not edited. It's not sanitized. It, it's just a crying out to God from your pain. Sometimes even the anger you'll sense in these uh, laments are directed towards God, which I believe is part of the process, or not process, but purpose of suffering and grief in this world. It's, it's actually move us into a, an encounter with God. We realize in the truly difficult moments of life that we're not in control. Uh, we're broken and we're hurting and helpless, and this should move us toward reaching out beyond ourselves to the person of God. Unfortunately, in our culture, whenever we're experiencing suffering and grief, we tend to reach out to other things that will mask or anesthetize or distract us from the pain of our grief. In Psalm 57, when David was on the run for his life and everything was just collapsing around him and he's hiding out inside of a cave, in addition to crying out to God over the calamity that's befallen him and the injustices that he's enduring, he says to God, Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me, for in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. In one of the darkest moments of his life, David cries out to God, while he's physically taking refuge in a cave. But from within, his soul is taking refuge in God. Where is it that you take refuge in life? Uh, someone once said that if you want to know who your God is, think about what you run to first to be safe, to feel secure. What do you run to when you need comfort. So I believe one of the purposes of difficult circumstances and suffering and loss and the grief that we experience as a result is to move us towards God's presence where maybe all we can do in that moment is just cry out from our grief. But even in the act of crying out to God, to me, this is an expression of faith. And therefore, it also has built into it an expression of hope in God, which I believe is also a purpose or a product of suffering and grief. In the article that Discomfort Your Feeling is Grief, David Kessler speaks about what he calls anticipatory grief. And anticipatory grief is this negative feeling that we get about what the future holds when we're uncertain. And Kessler says a lot of times it will center around death. He also says that it will often drift into worst case scenarios. And so you'll just begin to obsess over the many different ways someone in your house or your aging parents could get sick from the virus or how your job or your business is never going to recover. It's this feeling that, the, that a storm is brewing. That, that, that there's a storm coming, that the weather is getting bad, and, and you live with this underlying sense of fear and grief, but it's anticipatory grief because it hasn't happened, and in most cases, likely never will. It's anxiety over the expectation of future suffering, which he says is unhealthy. And the way to manage this grief, according to Kessler, is to bring your fears that have you know, gone off into the future, back into the present. And you focus on the fact that you're not sick and that nothing you've anticipated has happened and that in this moment, you are okay. And you just, you learn to let go of the things that you can't control. And I, although I think this is certainly helpful advice, I think the scriptures point towards something that goes beyond just being mindful of certain realities in the moment. If you read through the laments that you find in the books of Lamentations and that you'll see in the Psalms, you'll find that within all of these laments, there's this thread of hope in God that just rises up to the surface and appears in the midst of all of their sorrow and grief. If anticipatory grief could be defined as the fear that we experience over the expectation of future suffering, then hope is the opposite of that in the sense that it's the expectation of future good. You see, 
As human beings, we need hope. Uh, it's indispensable to our existence. Unlike animals, we are not designed such that our souls are satisfied simply with survival. Hope is what buoys up the human spirit and lifts us up and energizes our soul and motivates us to move forward. It is the expectation that we have of future good. And when there's absolutely no hope left, that's when you'll start to see people taking their life. But by its very nature, hope is something that must have an object. We have to put our hope in somebody or something, uh, be it God or our career or our spouse or maybe meeting that special person soon. I mean, whatever. Hope must have an object that it's based in, which for a follower of Jesus, that object is none other than God. And our hope is in the promises that God has made, which is demonstrated most clearly and powerfully in the resurrection of Jesus that we celebrated several weeks ago. The hope that we have in Jesus is that God is in the process of recreating and making all things new, and he will bring that to completion in the future. So our hope is in that, but it's also in the faith that we hold that God is with us even now, walking with us in the midst of our troubles and difficulties as we learn to trust him more and more. So hope is different than positivity or optimism or wishful thinking. It's deeper than that. It's stronger than that. And it's not based on circumstantial evidence or personal feelings. In fact, it often flies in the face of evidence where we live with this underlying sense of confidence that God is at work. Even in the midst of our most difficult circumstances, we place our hope in his ultimate goodness. Uh, but we need to know that hope is a virtue. It's one of the three great virtues, right? Faith, hope, and love. And by their very nature, virtues are not transitory in the sense that we are just passive recipients of them. They are character traits that are meant to be fed and grown and exercised. So one of the purposes of suffering and grief is, is to move us toward God where we're free to express our grief and our suffering. But in the process, we also develop and strengthen our faith and our hope as we process through our sufferings and learn to lean more into God during our difficult moments. As the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 5, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God is always at work in us through all the events and circumstances of our lives, and that includes suffering that Paul says produces in us character that then produces hope. And he says that hope does not disappoint. Our hope is that God is at work in our circumstances and in us. And I believe there's actually evidence of that in the midst of our current COVID-19 pandemic. For instance, and you know, I'm just speaking for myself here, but I know that this past month or so uh, has been the most time that I've spent in the presence of my immediate family members. I mean, I can't recall a time when we've been together this much over this long of an extended period of time. And with my son having gone off to college last year, but now obviously having to return home because of COVID-19, this is a situation that might not have happened as much in the future were it not for our circumstances. So this provides us with a very unique opportunity to spend some additional time together. Now, I know that there are some of us where being around your family might feel like an added layer of stress. And I get that. I get it. But even that could be a good thing in the long run, depending on the ways that you choose to handle that stress together. Uh, for some of us, uh, being removed from our work in different ways has maybe allowed you to step back for a moment and see how your work or your career has had an impact on your personal life. How much of your time and your energy it has required from you such that you've had very little left over by the time that you get home. 
Uh, for others of us, you know, being sheltered at home and you know having so many of the businesses closed has kept us from many of the activities and entertainment that we're used to enjoying. And maybe this has allowed us to see how much of our lives have been dependent upon our appetites that's, that has been influenced by our culture of consumerism and how that's affected our lives now that those things have been taken away. Our difficult situation has maybe provided us with this opportunity to become more aware of what's really important in life. Or it's maybe allowed us to step back for a moment and look at our life from a bigger picture perspective and come to see things for what they are. So in many ways, uh, more than one, there can be purpose in our suffering in how God might be using this situation to facilitate change and growth in us. But there's one thing that I've been hearing recently that I think wouldn't be a good idea. And we're starting to hear this more and more as the days and the weeks drag on and the intensity of our sheltering in place continues to wear upon our emotional and psychological well-being. You hear this desire on the part of people for things to go back to the way they were for things to return back to normal. People want things to return to normal. And yet, I don't think that's what we want to happen in more ways than one. And I'm not even sure that it's possible. I've heard sociologists and psychologists talk about how life will never be the same after COVID-19. Uh, even in David Kessler's comment from the article that discomfort you're feeling is grief alludes to the idea that, and I'm quoting him here again uh, in his article or in the article where he says, we feel the world has changed and it has. We know this is temporary, but it doesn't feel that way and we realize things will be different. Just as going to the airport is forever different from how it was before 9-11. Things will change and this is the point at which they changed. I personally feel like things are never going to be the same. We are not going back to the same kind of life that we had before COVID-19. Our lives are going to be different in ways that we yet don't really know. But even if we could go back, would we really want to go back? Would we want to go back to the way that things were? On my part, I'm going to say I wouldn't. Now, of course, there are things that I'm probably going to miss that might no longer be a part of our normal experience. For instance, are we ever going to be able to worship in the same ways in which we had come together in the past as a church family? Will our communal time of sharing a meal go back to the way that it was? Maybe not. And I would miss that dearly. But despite that, I've been seeing and experiencing things in our community, and I think this is happening in our country as well, but there is this sense of togetherness. There's a willingness on the part of people to sacrifice for the well-being of others, and that's a refreshing thing to see. There is a spirit of gentleness that I sense in our interactions with one another. I don't know if you feel that as well as you uh, go out to shop or when you're around other people. And I don't want that to go away, which I think that it would if we just go back to the way things normally were. Could it be that maybe God is providing us with an opportunity to enter into a new way of living, a new normal? And yet, I think we have to be careful because the familiar is always more appealing than an uncertain future. And this is demonstrated multiple times in the story of the Israelites coming out of captivity from Egypt. The moment they run into difficult or challenging circumstances, they start to complain, oh, that we could just go back to Egypt. Why, Moses, did you bring us out of Egypt into this desolate wilderness? At least in Egypt, we had a roof over our head and we had food that was provided to us. It would have been better for us if we had just stayed and died in Egypt. You see, the Israelites, they were quickly learning that freedom is an acquired taste. And if you're not willing to do the work of forming a community and a society and all of the effort that that will take, then the instinct will be to go 
back to the familiar because the familiar is comfortable, even if the familiar isn't what God wants for you or what's best for you. So what about you? In light of the things that you've been experiencing while sheltering in place, is there maybe a new normal that God is calling you to begin in your life? Irrespective of the new normal that I believe we're all going to be entering into as a society. Maybe for you, God is offering you the opportunity to begin to shift the alignment of what you place your hopes in from this point forward. Maybe you have the opportunity to reassign your priorities and make changes to where you invest your time in light of what you've learned in this past month. Maybe you've had an adjustment in your attitude towards other people and how you treat them and and how you see them that might be a new normal for you. Whatever the case, whatever you've discovered and learned, I hope that things don't go back to the way that they were. I really do think that God could be calling us into an era of a new normal, that there is a lot of potential good that God could make come of this. And maybe for you, things really will will change in your life. And you'll look back and you'll say, this is the point at which they changed. Let's pray together. Lord, uh, I know in this difficult time um, that we're all grieving Uh, in different ways and uh, in different severity. But I pray that in the midst of our grieving that we will be able to find meaning and purpose, Lord, whether that be through the opening up of our hearts and crying out to you and and, and, and letting you know our grievances, Lord, or whether that be in, in grabbing hold of our faith and the hope, Lord, that you bring to our lives even amidst, in the midst of our difficult circumstances, or whether that be, Lord, that we see within this time the ways in which you are maybe calling us and challenging us to begin a new normal in our lives. Uh, Lord, I think that there is purpose in suffering. As uh, counterintuitive as that might seem in our world, I believe that you use suffering to draw people to you, to increase and, 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 and help people to grow in faith and in hope and in character, Lord. And so I pray, Lord, that uh, uh, you would help us to do that, Father. So we thank you, Lord, and uh, I thank you for this time that we've had to be able to look into your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless. Take care, everyone. Hope to see you soon.